Welcome everyone and thank you for coming to today's lecture co-sponsored by the Montreal Health Equity Research Consortium and the Research Group on Constitutional Studies Lecture Series. I'm Jacob Levy, coordinator of RGCS. Uh, the Montreal Health Equity Research Consortium is a multidisciplinary research consortium directed by Nicholas King and Daniel Weinstock uh, with support from the Canadian Institutes of Health research. It studies questions such as what are the conceptual and ethical dilemmas underlying research in the social determinants of health, drawing on methods from philosophy, epidemiology, and behavioral psychology, and hurts researchers identify and investigate novel ethical frameworks to guide public policy and public health interventions that address health equity. The Research Group on Constitutional Studies lecture series is an ongoing series of talks on the values, institutions, and principles underlying a free society. And the Research Group on Constitutional Studies brings together faculty, postdocs, and graduate students, and undergraduates in a series of programs that include this lecture series, a student fellowship and doctoral fellowships, and ongoing research workshops and seminars in political theory, political philosophy, public law, political science, studying constitutional politics, federalism, and judicial review. Today we are very pleased, and it is my great honor, to welcome Jennifer Rubenstein, Assistant Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia. Professor Rubenstein holds a PhD and an MA from the University of Chicago, has been a visiting student at Nuffield College at Oxford, and holds a BA from Williams. She has been a costume link postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows of the Liberal Arts at Princeton University. She's widely published in the leading journals in political science and political philosophy, including the Journal of Political Philosophy, the British Journal of Political Science, and the Journal of Politics. At UVA, she's been the recipient of numerous grants and awards, in particular in support of innovations in teaching and work with students, including a pavilion seminar grant to develop a seminar with a group of UVA undergraduates on emergencies. And she was a Mead Honored Faculty Member, an award given to a small number of UVA faculty to implement ideas for contact and work with UVA undergraduates. Professor Rubenstein's work has long been characterized by significant methodological innovation in the study of the political theory of institutions that are not themselves states, but are actors in international society. She's a leading scholar of the ethics of international non-governmental organizations, doing work that draws on, but is not contained within, applied and professional ethics, and within, but not limited to, political theory, analyzing the kinds of institutions and kinds of organizations that NGOs are in global society, seeking to understand, in combination, the ethical considerations and constraints faced by actors within NGOs, decision makers, seeking to perform their duties in ethical fashion, and the demands of global justice, facing the question of what kinds of things NGOs are and how, what kinds of actors they are like in a world society characterized by significant life or death, distributive decisions, and decisions about how best to carry out actions in ethically compromised or dangerous or difficult settings. Her work has moreover consistently been characterized by an attention to the ethical choices faced by practitioners themselves and the ethical language that practitioners use. She's paid attention to how it is that people try to reconcile the tragic and difficult moral choices that they face, not taking their word as the last word, but treating it as a significant source of insight beyond what one would get by treating NGOs as actors within an idealized model of global distributive justice. It's work of which I've long been a fan and admirer and has now come together 
in the very important new book, Between Samaritans and States, The Political Ethics of Humanitarian INGOs, which is also the title of her talk to us today. If you ever want your work to sound much better than it actually is, ask Jacob to characterize it for you. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here today. My thanks to all of you for coming and to Jacob for inviting me and helping to organize my visit. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then I hope we can have a good conversation. Um, and you guys can teach me some stuff, too. So my comments today are going to draw from my new book, Between Samaritans and States, The Political Ethics of Humanitarian INGOs. So there are thousands of international non-governmental organizations, or INGOs, that do humanitarian work of one kind or another. But the humanitarian INGO sector is very top heavy. It's dominated by a small group of very large INGOs, many of which you've probably heard of, Oxfam, CARE, Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF, Save the Children. So these are the NGOs that raise the most money from the most donors and assist the most people and have the highest profiles. They also undertake a range of activities in addition to humanitarian aid, such as development aid, advocacy, research, and témoignage or witnessing. So in short, when it comes to the humanitarian INGO sector, these INGOs are where the action is. They're the subject of my book, and they're going to be the subject of my comments today. Am I blasting your ears out, or is the volume okay? It's okay? All right. Okay. Uh, so many humanitarian INGOs describe themselves in an apolitical register as merely responding to need or suffering. Many people interested in politics, including many political theorists, have largely taken them at their word and have therefore tended to dismiss humanitarian INGOs, even these very large ones, as too small scale and apolitical to be of much interest. I think this is a mistake. While we don't have precise figures, every year humanitarian INGOs significantly affect the life chances of tens of millions of people. Save the Children Alone uh, estimated that it reached 125 million people in 2012. So these INGOs have significant political and social effects, ranging from perpetuating violent conflict to exacerbating social tensions to altering cultural practices. As I'll discuss later, these INGOs are sometimes the primary source of basic public services to entire populations for years or even decades. But while they're larger scale and more political than many of us have acknowledged, humanitarian INGOs are far, far smaller and less powerful than myriad other actors on the global stage, including many states, corporations, UN agencies, religious orders, and armed groups. Every year, the US public spends far more money on pet food than the INGO sector spends on humanitarian aid, which might say more about pet owners in the United States than anything else, but it gives you a sense of the scale. So while humanitarian INGOs are sufficiently large scale and powerful that we shouldn't simply dismiss them as benign and irrelevant do-gooders, a central thing about them that we have to struggle to understand is how they function, given that they're highly constrained by all of these other more powerful actors. Humanitarian INGOs can, in some respects, trace their roots to predecessors in the abolitionist movement and colonial practices. Um, however, most of the large-scale Western-based humanitarian INGOs active today were only founded in the middle of the last century. The early reception of these INGOs is, I think, a topic worthy of further study. Um, but for several decades, at least, they've been perceived uh, in donor countries, at least, as a kind of moral saints. And let me just pause and say, by donor country, I mean countries that are primarily donors rather than recipients of humanitarian aid. Um, many so-called donor countries, such as France and Japan and the United States, have been the recipients of humanitarian aid also. And so-called recipient countries are also donors. So I don't want to gloss over that fact when I talk about donor and recipient countries. So anyway, this perception of humanitarian INGOs as moral saints can be seen in popular cultural portrayals, portrayals for example, in television shows like ER, in the public accolades, which uh, MSF received when it won the Nobel Prize in 1999, and this past summer in the highly visible role that MSF and Samaritan's Purse played in responding to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. So I think for residents of donor countries, 
donating to humanitarian INGOs seems a lot like putting money into do-gooding machines that reliably transform dollars into lives saved or suffering alleviated. So while there's this one public narrative about humanitarian INGOs that portrays them as moral saints or do-gooding machines, they're also frequently accused of myriad sins. Critics describe them as inefficient bureaucratic middlemen, ignorant of the complex social, political, and religious dynamics of the places where they work, as unaccountable to their intended beneficiaries, as blindly te technocratic, as toned to how their actions are perceived by local people, and as overly beholden to their donors. INGOs are also accused of undermining the capacity and responsiveness of domestic governments in the places where they work by providing goods and services in their stead and thereby exacerbating the very problems they claim to address. These criticisms have been elucidated in books with subtle titles such as Famine Crimes, Condemned to Repeat, The Road to Hell, The Selfish Altruist, The Dark Side of Virtue, and Displacing Human Rights. And yet, here's the rub. Even many, and there are some exceptions to this, but many of the most vocal critics of humanitarian INGOs don't actually want to see them just pack up and disappear immediately. For example, in Displacing Human Rights, Adam Branch offers a horrifying description of how humanitarian organizations worked hand in hand with the Ugandan government to perpetuate the internal displacement and immiseration of the Acholi people. But even Branch, at the end of the day, proposes reforms such as improved accountability. Uh, rather than dismantling humanitarian INGOs in their entirety. So, humanitarian INGOs are clearly not moral saints or do-gooding machines, but they're also not, or many of them are not, I think irredeemable incompetence or miscreants tr tr treading down the road to hell. So how should we approach thinking about the ethics of humanitarian INGOs? That's the question I'm going to address today. And my aim is to articulate an approach to humanitarian INGO ethics that enables us to understand the content of the ethical conflicts or predicaments they regularly face, to evaluate different paths for navigating this, these conflicts, and to comprehend what these predicaments themselves tell us about humanitarian INGOs, regardless of how particular INGOs choose to navigate particular predicaments in particular situations. So in other words, Regardless of how a given NGO decides to deal with a particular conflict, the fact that INGOs regularly face situations where they have no good courses of action available to them uh, should start to tell us something about them as actors. And just so you know in advance, so you're not disappointed, or maybe so you're relieved, um, I have no simple answers to the question of what INGOs should do, all things considered in specific situations. Instead, I'm going to offer what amounts to a kind of road map of treacherous terrain. And unfortunately, sometimes what maps tell us is that there isn't one best route or even any particular good ones from where we are to where we want to go. As I don't know if it's actually the case that there's no good route across this park, but um, that, that was my impression. Okay. Um, so the rest of my comments will proceed in four steps. First, I'm going to tell you about several existing approaches to humanitarian ING ethics and how I think they fall short. Next, I'm going to give you some concrete examples of some of the ethical predicaments that NGOs actively or regularly face. Then I'm going to give you my own alternative approach. And then I'm going to talk about the implications for individuals in wealthy countries who are thinking about donating to NGOs, um, which I take many, some of you, to be. Um, OK. So there's at least two ways that one might go about identifying existing approaches to humanitarian INGO ethics. One is to look at familiar ethical traditions, virtue ethics, consequentialism, deontology, and think about what these approaches might have to say about humanitarian INGOs. A problem with this approach is that most people aren't strict virtue ethicists, consequentialists, or deontologists, but instead accept aspects of all three approaches. So just looking at each of these approaches in isolation would be, I think, something of a straw man. I think that a better strategy, and the one that I pursue, is simply to survey the actual conception of a humanitarian INGO ethics that are out there, um, however nascent or limited they may be, looking in the literature, looking what activists say, looking at what humanitarian INGOs say, looking at what's implicit in their practices, and take those as a kind of starting place. So in the book, I discuss eight such approaches to thinking ethically about humanitarian INGOs. These are that 
Humanitarian INGOs are and should be rescuers of the people they seek to assist, equal partners with domestic NGOs or governments in the countries where they work, agents for their donors or agents for their intended beneficiaries, Similar to, but slightly different from the idea of them as agents for their intended beneficiaries is the idea that they should be accountable to their intended beneficiaries. Um, the next is the idea that they should be bound by traditional humanitarian principles of um, impartiality, neutrality, humanity, and independence. Um, and then the last two, which are a little different, um, aren't accounts of INGO political ethics, but they're claims about humanitarian INGOs that suggest that we don't need an account of political ethics because they're just irredeemable. Um, and so these include analogies between INGOs and multinational corporations and between INGOs and neocolonial governments. So I think that all eight of these approaches raise important questions about and or offer helpful insights into humanitarian INGO ethics. But singly and even together, even if we take them all together, I think they're inadequate, indeed woefully so. The reasons for this vary, but to a large extent, the problem with these approaches is that they rely on mischaracterizations of INGOs' capacities, their activities, their relationships, and or their effects. In the book, I explain all of this with reference to all eight of these approaches. Today, I'm just going to discuss three. Although, um, I put them all up here so we can discuss any of the others that you're interested in during the Q&A. So, first is the idea that INGOs are rescuers of the people they seek to assist. And some INGOs actively present themselves in this way. For example, MSF ran an advertisement describing itself as, quote, an emergency room team on call worldwide. Yet, conceptualizing INGOs as occupying the social role of rescuer is deeply misleading. Uh, and I'll just give you a few reasons why. Um, one is that humanitarian aid by INGOs is often long-term, lasting years or even decades. And as a result, INGOs develop relationships with the populations they seek to assist. Yet rescue is typically conceived of as being short-term. So the rescuer conception offers no leverage in thinking about the ethical or political implications of INGOs' relationships with the people they aim to assist. And in addition, while rescuers are typically conceived of merely responding, reacting to emergencies that happen, INGOs help to shape what situations get recognized as emergencies and which do not. And again, conceptualizing them as rescuers tells us nothing about this aspect of them. Yet another issue is that the paradigmatic problem for rescuers is that there's too many victims and too few rescuers. Yet what often happens for INGOs, particularly in high profile situations, is that there's too many INGOs and not enough victims. And INGOs end up stepping on each other's toes and getting in each other's way um, in their struggle for, for turf. And again, thinking of them as, rec as rescuers gives us no foothold in, this, um, in thinking about this issue. Whoa, okay. Uh, okay. Finally, while rescuers save helpless victims, uh, humanitarian INGOs aim to assist people who uh, typically retain at least some and often quite a bit of agency. So that's why we can't just say, oh, we don't need an account of humanitarian INGO ethics because they're just rescuers. So alternatively, in some respects at the other end of the spectrum, one might say, we don't need an account of humanitarian INGO political ethics um, because they're so, these organizations are so problematic um, and it's just sort of a waste of time to, to think about it in them in this way. One version of this idea is that INGOs reprise many of the patterns and power dynamics between colonizers and colonized and for this reason should cease to exist. So I think that the neocolonialism analogy highlights many disturbing but important features of INGOs. For example, that INGOs are outsiders who claim to help but in so doing dominate their intended beneficiaries and who gain power, resources, and prestige from doing so. But there are, of course, major differences between INGOs and colonial governments and other colonial actors. And so the colonial resonances of humanitarian INGOs, therefore, don't obviate the need for an account of humanitarian INGO ethics. Rather, it's just the opposite. Uh, they help to explain why such an account is necessary. So maybe you already knew that humanitarian INGOs aren't really rescuers, and maybe you know that, yeah, the neocolonialism thing is important, but maybe doesn't explain everything. But maybe you think, okay, 
And what really explains INGOs, what they really should do is be equal partners with the domestic NGOs they work with, with host governments, with the populations that they serve. I don't think so. Uh, and let me tell you why. Uh, so this language of partnership is ubiquitous in the INGO sector. As one commentator put it, everybody wants to be a partner with everyone on everything everywhere. If the rescuer conception is initially appealing because it seems to embody humanitarian norms, equal partnership is initially compelling because it seems to embody egalitarian norms. So one limitation of equal partnership as a normative ideal for INGOs is that it doesn't address the underlying structural inequality that persists so long as domestic NGOs rely on their INGO partners for funds, and that's typically how it goes. An INGO partners with a domestic NGO, but it funds that domestic NGO. Um, so the domestic NGO is totally reliant on its INGO partner. A second limitation that I think hasn't gotten quite as much recognition is that equal partnership implies a particular kind of equality. It implies equal participation by everyone who is able and willing to help achieve some goal. But another kind of equality might be superior to this one. Equality understood as having a say proportional to how much one's basic interests are affected. In other words, equal partnership implies that humanitarian INGOs and their domestic NGO partners should have equal say. But one might think that on egalitarian and democratic grounds that domestic NGOs should have a greater say. So all we really need, I think, to criticize these eight existing approaches is a basic understanding of INGOs' activities, capacities, relationships, and effects. But I think in order to develop a positive approach and a better alternative, we need more detail. So now I want to turn to several uh, examples um, uh, of the ethical predicaments that humanitarian INGOs regularly face. For each predicament, I'll start by giving you one or two concrete examples, and then I'll briefly characterize the more general, the predicament itself in more general terms. Okay, so our first example occurred in the Rwandan refugee camps in Zaire after the Rwandan genocide. So in 1994, the Tutsi dominated Rwandic, Rwandan Patriotic Front routed the Hutu dominated Rwandan Armed Forces, or FAR, to end the Rwandan genocide. Almost two million Hutus, including both civilians and ex-members of the FAR, ex-members of the FAR, streamed out of Rwanda and into camps in Burundi, Tanzania, and what was then Zaire. The camps in Zaire soon, between, soon became highly militarized. This putatively ex-FAR, they claimed they were demilitarized, but they weren't, um, seeking to regroup and rearm, stole vast quantities of aid intended for civilians. They also used the civilians in the camps to garner international sympathy and as human shields. Several INGOs were working in these camps, including Oxfam, CARE, and MSF. And these NG INGOs knew that all of this was happening. They knew this militarization of the camps was happening. They therefore faced a wrenching decision. Should they continue to provide water, medical care, and other services in the camps, knowing that in so doing they were enabling the XFAR, the XFAR to gain strength, or should they withdraw, thereby depriving legitimate refugees of needed services? So this example is extreme, but humanitarian INGOs working in conflict settings regularly face ethical predicaments of, with roughly this structure. They can continue providing basic services to a large population, knowing that their presence and some of their resources are being redeployed for grossly unjust purposes, or they can withdraw and prevent this from happening, thereby removing needed services from people who really need them. Our next predicament um, involves resource allocation. I'll give you two examples of this. In 2000, the town of Gulu in northwest Uganda was struck by an Ebola epidemic. At the time, the conventional wisdom was that Ebola epidemics burn out on their own fairly quickly. So the worry wasn't primarily about how to con contain the epidemic from spreading. Um, MSF, one of the few organizations providing health care in the area, decided to divert resources away from a basic health care it was run care program it was running in the surrounding area and direct those to dealing with the Ebola epidemic. One, one MSF employee defended the decision on the grounds that, quote, alleviation of suffering and dying in dignity was enormously important. We know we saved very few lives. 
But then another MSF employee responded by saying, how would you explain to a villager from the outskirts of Gulu the choice MSF made in addressing the problem of Ebola, but not the health problems in his village, when those health problems in the village could actually um, save many more lives? So that's one example. Here's another example of this allocation-related predicament as described by, uh, to me by a MSF employee, Kenny Gluck. And he said, we treat tuberculosis in South Sudan. It is incredibly expensive. We fly in the doctors and the nurses. We fly in the labs. A reasonable person thinking with a utilitarian mind will say, why don't you do that when you're in Uganda? You're practically in the same area. You can treat these people for a tenth of the cost. You'd save 10 times more lives with that amount of money. Well, could these people have been stuck in this war zone facing massacre and mere genocide for 50 years? That's why we're working with them. So these are both examples of a kind of ethical predicament that humanitarian INGOs face regularly. In deciding how to use their limited resources, how much weight should they put on simply saving lives, or in more te technical terms, maximizing the number of quality adjusted life years that they provide per dollar spent? And how much should they pursue other aims that are more difficult or even impossible to quantify, such as helping people die with dignity, as MSF was trying to do in the Ebola epidemic, expressing outrage, or standing in solidarity with an abused population. Next, since you're not depressed enough already, um, we have um, two examples of an ethical predicament that often arises in the context of advocacy by NGOs. So in 2010, the INGO's Global Witness and Enough helped to write the text of the Conflict Minerals Provision, Section 1502 of the Dodd-Frank Bill in the US Congress and strongly influenced, uh, this sounds boring, but it was actually even more important, they strongly influenced the lineup of speakers at a Security and Exchange Commission roundtable about how to implement the provision. Section 1502 was meant to help reduce conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo by requiring US-based companies to show that the minerals they purchased from the DRC did not come from conflict mining. Many Congolese and US-based experts and activists, as well as leaders of several Congolese civil society organizations, argued that the bill would not only fail to accomplish its intended objectives, but it would further impoverish Congolese miners. These experts and activists were largely excluded from deliberations about the bill, yet some of the outcomes they predicted appear to have come to pass. So here's a second example of a advocacy-related ethical predicament. That's a little more subtle. In March of 2011, Oxfam and three Ghanaian NGOs released a report that they had jointly commissioned called Achieving a Shared Goal, Free Universal Health Care in Ghana. And you can see I've circled at the bottom that Oxfam got equal billing with these Ghanaian NGOs. They co-released the report together. The report asserted that, quote, the current health system in Ghana is unfair and inefficient, and that Ghana's national health insurance scheme should be dismantled and replaced with free at point of service health care for all, funded primarily by tax revenues. So this report generated a huge controversy, both in Ghana and in international development circles. Ghana's National Health Insurance Authority, the main government agency criticized in the report, argued that the report was a, quote, sloppily researched effort by Oxfam, oh, sorry, was a sloppily researched effort by Oxfam to, quote, tarnish a homegrown African initiative. The World Bank issued its own report about Ghana's healthcare system in which it also repeatedly referred to this report as uh, the Oxfam report and the report's Ox arguments as Oxfam's critique, again, ig totally ignoring the Ghanaian NGOs that were equally equal participants in um, uh, commissioning and releasing it. So these two very different instances of INGO advocacy point to a common problem. To what extent should INGOs engage in advocacy and other activities themselves, and to what extent should they step back and try to support other, at least potentially superior actors, in this case, uh, Congolese civil society organizations and Ghanaian NGOs? So I want to give you one final example. This one involved uh, INGOs' use of visual images, especially photographs and video. Uh, on May 28, 2003, the British newspaper The Daily Mirror pub published a photograph of the Irish rock musician Bob Geldof handing a baby, mechanic Philippos, to the baby's mother 
Bazunesh Abraham at the Yerba Therapeutic Feeding Center near Owasa, Ethiopia. So the photograph portrays Geldof as a sun-dappled savior, beneficently delivering the malnourished mechanic into the arms of his disconsolate mother. Geldof's visit to Yura had been arranged by Save the Children and UNICEF as part of a publicity tour meant to put Africa more squarely on the agenda of an upcoming G8 summit. At the time of the visit, Save the Children had policies prohibiting the use of this kind of image in its own materials. Yet it was willing to facilitate the dissemination of this kind of image in newspapers. Uh, as the program director for Save the Children UK and Addis Ababa put it, this photograph and now I'm quoting, is not an image we like. In fact, we try to avoid it as much as possible. You won't see any of that on our literature, but we do work with therapeutic feeding and we do have children that look like that. And I tell you, it opens the pockets and that's the reality you are forced into. So this again is just one example of a larger predicament that humanitarian INGOs face over and over again. Should they simply raise as much money as possible, even if this means using degrading or even in some ways misleading images? Or should they limit the images that they use or the images that they facilitate other actors in using uh, on ethical grounds, even if this means raising less money? So I think these are some of the issues that an adequate account of humanitarian INGO ethics uh, an adequate approach to thinking about humanitarian INGO ethics, these are the kinds of problems they should help us, an approach should help us to address. So I want to turn next to describing the approach that I lay out in my book that I think does an okay job of doing that. Okay, so this approach can be summed up in a sentence. Uh, we should think of humanitarian INGOs as somewhat governmental, as highly political, and as often second best. So as this summary conveys, I think that any adequate account of humanitarian INGO ethics must conceive of humanitarian INGOs as political actors, and so must be an account of humanitarian INGO political ethics. So let me now briefly explain what I mean by each of these three terms. So humanitarian non-governmental organizations are ostensibly not governments. Uh, but they, in fact, engage in at least two very specific kinds of governance, which I call conventional governance and global governance. INGOs engage in conventional governance when they undertake governance functions that are roughly analogous to those performed by conventional domestic governments. These include acting as the sole or almost sole provider of basic goods and services to whole populations. For example, what the INGOs were doing in the Rwandan, in the Rwandan refugee camps in Zaire. Shaping the rules of coercive institutions. For example, what enough and global uh, witness did with Section 1502 of the Dodd-Frank Bill, uh, and making large-scale decisions about resource use that have public effects, like MSF's decision to deal with the Ebola epidemic rather than providing basic uh, health services in the surrounding area. So this kind of conventional governance by INGOs is a common phenomenon. Writing about what he calls unusable Africa, Anthropologist James Ferguson describes, quote, a kind of government by, by NGO, often in a humanitarian mode, with a hodgepodge of, tra of transnational private voluntary organizations carrying out the day-to-day -day work of providing rudimentary governmental and social services, especially in areas of crisis and conflict. So I'm not saying that humanitarian INGOs always engage in governance. I'm saying they sometimes do more and less in different situations, hence the somewhat. Okay. Uh, humanitarian INGOs engage in global governance in several ways. Most notably, they help to constitute the in, what scholars have called the international humanitarian order, which can itself be seen as a kind of global governance institution. This international order manifests itself in both informal norms and informal umbrella organizations, such as Interaction, Sphere, People in Aid, and the Humanitarian Accountability Partnership, among others. Okay, so even when humanitarian INGOs aren't engaged in these forms of governance, they're still highly political. This is so ev even of INGOs that claim to be neutral or to stay out of politics or to only respond to suffering. So like governance, political is a vague term, but I mean it again in two very specific ways without denying that INGOs can be political in other ways. First, humanitarian INGOs frequently have political effects. 
For example, as I discussed earlier, the INGOs in the camps, in uh, the Rwandan camps in Zaire, were empowering the XFAR, this sort of militarized army, right? They, they were having a political effect. Um, Second, INGOs exercise discursive power, by which I mean they help to shape widely shared meanings and understandings in ways that have political effects. For example, by calling some situations but not others emergencies, INGOs help to shape perceptions about whether a given situation is an emergency, as well as more general ideas about what kinds of situations count as emergencies. The third main feature of humanitarian INGOs that my account of their political ethics foregrounds is that they're often second best actors. And by second best here, I don't mean that they're like second best only as opposed to first best. I mean um, uh, that they're something less than first best. So I don't mean second best rather than third best or seventh best, I just mean that they're not first best. Uh, so this notion is more complicated than it initially appears. But Roughly speaking, it refers to the idea that INGOs undertake activities, including but not only governance activities, that other actors such as local governments, domestic NGOs, transnational social movements have the potential to perform better. So for example, we might say that Oxfam was the second best actor compared to the Ghanaian NGOs when it came to advocating about domestic health policy in Ghana, and that MSF was the second best actor compared to the Ugandan government when it came to deciding how to allocate resources for addressing public health issues within Uganda. Okay, so what are these three ideas that INGOs are somewhat governmental, highly political, and often second best, tell us about humanitarian INGO political ethics in general? What light can it shed on the specific ethical predicaments that I described earlier? So let me address these questions in turn. I'm gonna start with the big picture, and then I'll return to the specific problems that I was telling you about earlier. So first, the more general picture. Okay, the more that INGOs engage in conventional governance activities, the more responsibility they have to focus on the overall effects or consequences of their actions. So the underlying connection between conventional governance and consequences is that conventional governments shape the reasonable expectations and significantly affect the basic interests of many people in a comprehensive and ongoing way. So, Conventional governance pulls us towards thinking about overall consequences and outcomes. On the other hand, recognizing that INGOs engage in global governance are political and often second best suggests that these consequences uh, must be are plural in form, that INGOs can't focus narrowly on maximizing one kind of value. In short, INGOs should navigate the ethical predicaments they face in what I call a pluralist consequentialist mode. So I'm not gonna go back through and explain how pluralist consequentialism differs from the eight approaches that I talked about, well I guess I only talked about three, but the eight approaches that I listed earlier, except to say that this is much more general than those. What I wanna do to clarify this a little bit further is to compare it to four other ways of thinking about humanitarian ING ethics that are equally uh, general as this one. Okay, so uh, here, here are some alternatives to help clarify this idea. One is the idea that, okay, what really matters about humanitarian INGOs is their intentions. And this isn't because consequences don't matter, but rather the idea here is that good consequences are assumed to follow reliably from good intentions. So it should be clear by now that this assumption is a destructive fantasy. INGOs work in situations that are far too political and conflictual, and their knowledge and power are far too limited for a focus on intentions to be adequate. So a second alternative to pluralist consequentialism is the idea endorsed by some aid practitioners, and you might think this is a little kooky, okay, but this is a, a pretty commonly held idea, uh, that what matters about INGOs is the intrinsic value of their actions apart from whatever effects those actions might have. So as one aid worker put it, quote, I do not care if we can or cannot know that humanitarianism has improved the lives of others in need, I know that I must act. This approach is often connected to the concept of the humanitarian imperative or the idea that there is, quote, an obligation to provide humanitarian aid wherever it is needed. So again, it should be clear by now that this sort of approach doesn't sufficiently acknowledge that humanitarian aid can cause harm. I think it has other problems as well that we can talk about, but that's the main one. Okay, so pluralist consequentialism also diverges from two other approaches that also focus on consequences. 
One is so-called political humanitarianism, which suggests that humanitarian aid should always be leveraged in the service of one or a few broader political aims, such as women's, right, women's rights or democracy. Not only are such efforts often self-undermining on their own terms, they just don't work very well, uh, they're not sufficiently pluralistic given INGO's varied capacities, relationships, and roles. So the last alternative is the idea defended by proponents of effective altruism that INGOs should maximize the number of quality adjusted life years or qualities that they provide per dollar spent. And so I talked about this earlier. This approach can lead to a strong bias in favor of interventions that can be measured easily and cheaply, such as mosquito nets and deworming programs, and against more political activities, such as democratic empowerment that cannot. OK, so I now want to explain what conceiving of INGOs as somewhat governmental, highly political, and often second best tells us about the specific ethical predicaments, the specific examples that I talked about earlier. Um, so to do this, I'm going to walk you through a table. It's a little scary, but stay with me. Um, OK, so you already understand a lot of this. You already understand the examples on this first column, right? And you already understand the features on the second column. So we're just going to be talking about the last two columns. So you're 50% of the way there. OK, so first recall the INGOs in the Rwandan refugee camps in Zaire. So they had to decide whether to stay and continue providing aid, even though they were empowering the ex-FAR, or withdraw. So the more that service provision by these INGOs functions as a form of conventional governance, the more reason they had to do whatever would have the best consequences, even if this meant staying and continuing to provide aid. Like Politicians, INGOs, don't have the luxury of keeping their hands entirely clean. Yet unlike politicians, especially those discussed in the literature on dirty hands, INGOs contribute to injustices perpetrated primarily by others. For this reason, I think we should talk about INGOs not as having dirty hands, but having spattered hands. The dirt on their hands comes in part from actions undertaken by others. Viewing situations like the Rwandan refugee camps in Zaire as spattered hands problems suggests that INGOs should sometimes allow their hands to be spattered. That is, they should sometimes continue to provide aid when the benefits of doing so outweigh the costs, even though this means contributing to injustice. But they should view this as a moral sacrifice or compromise for which they owe a public explanation. And even, I think, sometimes in extreme cases, maybe even compensation. The spattered hands framework leaves a lot undecided, but it rules out several lines of argument that are often invoked in debates about these types of situations and that were actually invoked in the Rwanda case. Uh, these include the arguments that INGOs should do no harm, that they have to continue providing aid regardless of the effects because that is their remit or their, their duty. Um, and that they have, another idea is that they have full-fledged dirty hands. So I think the idea that they have spattered hands um, is, a, is a better conceptualization of, of this problem. All right, so let's now turn to our next two examples involving resource allocation. Remember Ebola versus basic health in Uganda um, and TB treatment in Uganda versus TB treatment in South Sudan. Uh, so the question, as you'll recall, is whether INGOs should try to maximize measurable good outcomes or also pursue goals that are more difficult or impossible to measure. And I call this predicament the cost-effectiveness conundrum. So how should INGOs navigate this conundrum? How should they think about this problem? Again, insofar as their decisions about resource use function as a form of conventional governance, they must, again, attend to overall consequences. But insofar as their decisions function as forms of global governance or discursive power, and insofar as they are second best actors, the consequences that they have reasons to promote and are able to promote are diverse. Too much emphasis on cost effectiveness, narrowly construed, underestimates the degree to which INGOs can function as expressive political actors that take stands in order to ignite outrage and pressure first best actors to fulfill their responsibilities, like what MSF was trying to do in South Sudan, expressing outrage, standing in solidarity. Conversely, too much emphasis on INGOs' expressive aspects underestimates the conventional governance role and the responsibilities for consequences that it generates. So I propose that INGOs adopt what I call an ethics of resistance as a form of political judgment that acknowledges the pull of both of these sources of responsibility. The ethics of resistance can be distinguished from other allocative principles that INGOs or scholars endorse. Uh, the idea that aid should be provided on the basis of need alone, that INGOs should maximize qualities, quality adjusted life years, 
and um, MSF's idea, what they call the ethics of refusal, which argues against putting any weight at all on issues of cost effectiveness. Okay, now recall our third predicament. Uh, the examples here were enough and global witness advocacy on the Section 1502 of the Dodd-Frank Bill and Oxfam's advocacy on healthcare in Ghana. The question here was, to what extent should INGOs pursue their own substantive goals and to what extent should they step back and support or pressure first best actors to act in their stead? And I call this the quandary of the second best. Viewing INGO advocacy as a form of uh, unelected representation as political theorists often do or as partnership as INGOs often do obscures this quandary because these lenses suggest that INGOs should strive to be good representatives and equal partners respectively. So if what they're doing is engaging in representation, then they should represent well. And if the idea is they, they're partners, they should be equal partners. What's obscured here is the thought that maybe what they should be doing is stepping back and supporting other actors um, in advocating in their stead. Uh, uh, so rather than or alongside of representation or partnership, I think we should just think of INGO advocacy as the use of power and in normatively evaluating INGO advocacy, we should ask how well INGO advocates avoid misusing their power. This perspective, this perspective helps us to see that while Global Witness and Enough clearly misused their power, Oxfam did too, albeit in a much subtler way. Okay, finally, the issue of visual images and the photograph of Bob Geldof and Bezinesh Abraham in the Daily Mirror. At issue here is how INGOs should deal with ethical predicaments associated with their portrayal-related practices. And I use this broad term, portrayal-related practices, because it's not just the images they use, remember, it's how they facilitate images in other places. So at first blush, it looks like these situations involve a dilemma of need versus dignity. And in fact, this is exactly how Oxfam describes it. Uh, it appears that this dilemma pertains solely to images and INGO's own materials, that the responses to this dilemma, the response to this dilemma is to develop criteria for distinguishing ethical from unethical images, right? Like we want to have some criteria for giving images thumbs up or a thumbs down, um, and that these criteria should take the form of guidelines, rules, or codes of conduct. Okay, once we foreground the idea that INGO's portrayal-related practices function as a form of discursive power, that is that they help to shape shared meanings and that they have other political effects, it becomes apparent that all four of these assumptions, all four of these ways of thinking about this problem are mistaken. Rather than a dilemma of need versus dignity, INGOs face a trade-off between raising money, utilizing appeals to moral feelings, and avoiding an array of bad outcomes, only some of which involve dignity. I call this the moral motivation trade-off. This trade-off extends to all of INGO's portrayal-related activities, including facilitating the publication of photographs in newspapers, not only publishing images in INGO's own materials. So Save the Children is not off the hook simply because the image came out in a newspaper rather than in their own materials. Navigating this trade-off requires treating INGO's portrayal-related practices holistically as opposed to giving a thumbs up or thumbs down to individual images. It also requires not only rules of conduct, but also, I think, creative practices. These practices include engaging in what I call critical visual rhetoric, which involves using potentially objectionable images to grab viewers' attention and draw them into a more nuanced understanding of the issues. So, these are some stills from an MSF video. It's about a six minute long video. Um, and it begins, you can see in the top left, with sort of familiar famine iconography to draw viewers in. But by the end, it portrays the main subject, Natasha, as a fully human individ individual with her own inner life. And you sort of can get a sense of that um, by looking um, at, the, at how the, Im the images change over the course of the video. So to summarize, if we conceptualize humanitarian INGOs as somewhat governmental, highly political, and often second best, we can understand the specific examples uh, I have discussed here and other similar cases as problems of spattered hands, cost-effectiveness conundrums, quandaries of the second best, and moral motivation trade-offs. And we can see that they should often navigate these predicaments in a pluralist, consequentialist mode, which means sometimes allowing their hands to be spattered, enacting an ethics of resistance, not misusing their power, and engaging in critical visual resurrects. See, now you understand the whole thing. Okay. 
So this approach to humanitarian INGO political ethics is intended to enhance, and I really want to emphasize this, this is meant to enhance, not replace, fully contextual judgments about specific situations, right? It doesn't shy away from the conclusion that INGOs regularly face ethical predicaments for which there are no good options. This conclusion connects the project of humanitarian INGO political ethics with a broader assessment of the promise and limitations of INGOs as political actors. Okay. Uh, whoops. What does all of this mean for you? Uh, I want to conclude by briefly discussing the implications of what I've said for relatively well-off residents of donor countries, which uh, I'm imagining many of you are. So in particular, you might be wondering, should I donate to a humanitarian INGO? If so, which one? And what are my responsibilities as a donor? I can't offer full answers to these questions, but I'm just going to try and say a few things about them. First, should you donate to a humanitarian INGO? I think it's possible to find INGOs that do considerably more good than harm, at least in the short to medium term. So as long as you're willing to do your research to find those organizations, and I'll say more about that in a minute, um, I don't think you, should, you shouldn't not donate. Let me say it again, you shouldn't not donate. Uh, to my mind, the bigger question is, what are the opportunity costs of donating? Could you put your money to some better or some more appropriate use? The answer to this question depends on your understanding of your ethical responsibilities. For example, whether you think your duties are negative or positive, as well as your evaluation of other efforts to address other issues. So one thing that would be enormously helpful in this regard is if someone, perhaps, are there any undergrads here? Raise your hand. Okay, so if one of you um, could figure out a way uh, to evaluate the effects of more political activities, such as advocacy and witnessing, so that there would be less of a trade-off between what is measurable, doing what is measurable, and doing what is valuable. So um, get on that and let me know what you come up with. Okay, suppose you've decided to donate to a humanitarian INGO. Which one should you pick? One criteria that I think you should not use uh, in making this decision is the proportion of an INGO's funding that is spent on administrative versus program costs. So this is emphasized by Charity Nav Navigator and some other of these websites that evaluate INGOs. Uh, because humanitarian INGOs work in political contexts, they must study the political dynamics of the situations in which they work. And this is often characterized as an administrative expense. Um, so are efforts to make the global governance institutions in which they participate more just. So a more relevant question than how much money an INGO spends on administration versus program costs is how much it can accomplish per dollar spent, regardless of whether that dollar comes, is characterized as an administrative cost or a program cost. But for reasons I've explained, we should also be wary of focusing too narrowly on maximizing cost effectiveness because some activities have sources of value that are difficult or even impossible to measure, including especially more political and expressive activities, as well as working in deep collaboration with aid recipients. So all of this suggests that donors should be amenable to methods of reporting by INGOs that are better able to capture these diverse forms of value, such as more narrative accounts. But because narratives often tell the stories of single individuals in gripping ways, it's important to avoid letting the psychological resonance and the drama of these accounts distract from other relevant considerations, such as the number of people affected and unintended negative effects. So triangulating among all of these imperfect strategies for evaluating INGOs is a lot of work for individual donors, and this is again a reason why we need more both more sophisticated media coverage and I think also, and more importantly, other independent entities tasked with evaluating humanitarian INGOs. So let me shift now to start incorporating the third question, which is related to the second. The second is, what NGO should you fund? And the third one is, okay, once you're already a donor, what are your responsibilities? As a first cut, as a rough first cut, I want to suggest that rather than viewing donating to INGOs as putting money in a do-gooding machine, we should think of donors as standing in a citizen relationship with the INGOs to which they contribute. So you're kind of a citizen of the NGO to which you contribute. Pushing this analogy further, we could say that donors are analogous to powerful citizens in a vastly unequal polity where other citizens, that would be aid recipients and potential aid recipients, are pretty much completely disenfranchised. That is, they have very little say in what happens. 
This analogy reflects the idea that INGOs operate in complex political environments where good intentions do not always yield good outcomes, and getting things done sometimes requires making difficult compromises for which the INGOs are nonetheless responsible, right? So that's how we think about politicians. We understand that it's complicated, it's hard to get things done, but they're still, at the end of the day, responsible for what they do. The complexity of the situations in which INGOs act and the need for them to consult with their intended beneficiaries also suggests that donors might do well to demand rather general promises ex ante, um, uh, that just ask in, for general commitments from NGOs about how they're going to deal with some of these predicaments, um, but then demand very specific after the fact explanations. This analogy also suggests that a major responsibility of donors to INGOs isn't not only to hold INGOs accountable, but also to push them to be more accountable to their intended beneficiaries. Not only in the weak sense of explaining themselves to their intended beneficiaries, but to fully enfranchise them. This means that I think we should maybe, and this is something that I'm working on now, have some hesitation about practices such as embedded giving, where a portion of the proceeds from a purchase go to an NGO, or even donating in honor of loved ones, insofar as these practices promote either a market-based or private sentimental orientation to INGOs rather than a citizenship orientation. Okay, so all of this is very complicated. I wanna leave off by mentioning two common mistakes that donors often make, but that you can avoid. One, I think, is putting independent weight on the number of countries in which an INGO works. So many INGOs emphasize, we work in dozens of countries, we work in over 100 countries. For example, this is, oh, where'd it go? How do I go backwards? Oh, now I've really, what have I done? Okay. Ah, uh, from current slide. Okay. Well, use your imaginations. <laughs> Remember everything we talked about, little review. And there we go. Okay. Okay, okay. So this is an example. Most NGOs have a, a thing like this on their websites. We work in so many countries. Isn't that great? Pay no attention. Okay. Um, while it might be instrumentally valuable uh, for NGOs to work in a lot of countries, I don't think there's anything intrinsically value about working in more rather than fewer countries. Oh my goodness, okay. The other mistake is putting too much, this is another thing that I'm working on, is putting too much weight on dramatic emergencies, especially those that have eye-catching visuals. These arrest our attention and pull at our heartstrings, but again, there doesn't seem to be anything intrinsically more important about dramatic emergencies than other emergencies or even ongoing bad states of affairs that could be effectively addressed. Okay, so if there's one thing that I want to leave you here today with, it is that humanitarian INGOs are not do-gooding machines, but nor for the most part are they miscreants on the road to hell. Instead, they're sometimes governmental, highly political, and often second best. Conceptualizing them in this way provides a basis for understanding the ethical predicaments they face, thinking sensitively about better and worse ways for them to navigate these predicaments, and evaluating humanitarian INGOs as actors. And this, in turn, helps us to notice and support the valuable work that INGOs do, criticize them and look for alternatives when they fall short, and keep in mind the much bigger part, the much bigger picture of which they, the people they seek to assist, and all of us here today are a part. Thank you. I'll shout too. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay. I'm most worried about the long-term effects on government capacity and on uh, other political capacity, capacity in aid recipient countries. It's really hard to commensurate these different harms, especially because they occur at such different time frames. But th those are, so, so it's hard to give a sort of a full-fledged explanation for why. Um, 
But, um, but my sense is that, that for sort of consequentialist reasons over the long term, that kind of undermining is what I'm most concerned about. Which is why the kind of second best aspect of things is kind of so integral to my account. Um, hi, I'm Caleb uh, Purcell with the RGCA. Um, yeah, so, um, so my question is, is about um, the sort of effective altruism point of view. Um, I mean, I, I think that a lot of the, the response that you gave um, to that point of view are actually forms of the effective altruism view, it's just that it's a more um, enlightened way of pursuing cost-effectiveness, right? So what you're saying is that many interventions um, have long-term consequences that will make it the case that actually they're more effective, right, for a given cost. So, so, and then you also say that sometimes it's very difficult to measure the actual effects, but they are actually effective. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's, that's still, that can still be sort of in line with a kind of effective altruism view. I think where the, the real sort of philosophical question comes in is, you know, you have that quote from the guy from MSL, I think, um, where, so, I mean, okay, so imagine a case where the, the type of harm um, remedy the same, that the only difference is numbers. So say in South Sudan, you can protect people against tuberculosis at a much higher cost. And so very, very many fewer people can be protected from tuberculosis than say in Sudan, right? Um, and, and let's say that that's the case sort of long term. I, I, I think that what that guy from Amazon was saying is that, look, there's a, there's an additional reason why we ought nevertheless to help the people in South Sudan, which is that those people are much worse off overall. I mean, that, that's one way maybe of interpreting what, what you're saying, right? So they've experienced all these other harms like genocide and so on. So, so overall, they're much worse off. So there's a kind of prioritarian reason um, to benefit them instead of benefiting other people who are you know, still badly off and maybe still bad, better off than the people in South Sudan. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that? So that, I think that would present a kind of deep philosophical objection to, to the kind of, you know, let's just look at qualities type of view. Whereas I think some of the responses that you had are actually sort of at least philosophically consistent with, with an effective altruism view. Okay, so there's two parts to the question. One is, isn't this really just more sophisticated effective altruism? And then the other part is, well, is there another independent value here that's about people who are worse off, um, like prioritizing people who are worse off, right? OK, so let me take those in turn. So the effective altruism people also say, hey, we agree. Um, but when you look at their website, and I do think this is a gap that is bridgeable over time. And that's why I said I want people to work on figuring out how to measure this other stuff. But if you look at their website, it, you know, what are the um, uh, uh, or, uh, causes that they support. It's, you know, bed nets, cystosomiasis. I mean, you um, give directly is a, is a little bit different. But um, it's really hard, and they're, they're, they're fully aware of this, but it is really, really hard to measure all this other stuff. Um, so I think, so that's, so that's one issue. A second issue is there might be things that are valuable but are just impossible to measure. You know, some things might be just hard, but some things might be really, like, impossible to commensurate. Um, and so, so that those are alternative sources of value. And then um, what you're talking, and so I think um, people, the sort of prioritarian thing that you're talking about could be one of those alternatives. Um, I think that, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, I would suspect that the MSF people, especially because there's such a long time frame, like 50 years, I think they would resist the idea that there's just this kind of like um, measure of better offness and worse offness and they pick South Sudan because they're worse off. Their vocabulary is um, just sort of more multifaceted and it involves sort of, you know, standing alongside of victims of 
genocide um, and standing in solidarity and making statements and things like that. So I think they, while they, they might be amenable to that as sort of part of the description of what they do, they're doing, I think they would be a little resistant of, um, of reducing it to that. Hi, Daniel. Um, I'm going to be rude and ask and run. Um, uh, but I have a couple questions for you. Uh, two, two questions uh, which are actually related. The first is, towards the end of what you were saying, you were talking about the fact that donors should um, ask for general sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of general, general statements of purpose at the outset and more specific sort of post hoc. And then you said something about not focusing too much on the sort of dramatic event and perhaps more on sort of long term work. I wonder if those two things sort of are in tension with one another because, you know, events that catastrophic events that have a clear before and after, as opposed to just sort of long term sort of problems that some NGOs are dealing with. Um, you know, it could be that if you want, if you want to have NGOs that are dealing with long term problems, the before and after might not be as clear as that first requirement would require that it be. Is that clear? Ish. Let me try. Okay. Okay. Um, Should I just ask that question? And, and um, the second thing has to do with, oh. with sort of uh, donor, donor, sort of epistemic requirements on donors. So you know, you 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 spent you spent some time sort of spelling out the requirements that donors uh, should take on epistemically, you know, to judge whether their money is being well used. And I wonder whether you know we might not end up exceeding carrier capacity. In other words, whether this and and so I just want to throw out a proposal to you. And I just thought of it, and I don't know if it's a good proposal or not. We have something here in, in, uh, in Montreal called Sadre, which is a, a sort of a, a it's, it's kind of a place that you send money to. It's and the people there can decide who the worthy charities are. Um, now, it's you know, obviously open to all kinds of possibilities of abuses, and, uh, but assume that you could get a system like that that worked well, where you had a board of people, perhaps Jennifer Rubenstein uh, could sit on it, and you know, they would be tasked with taking the time that we don't have in order to disperse money. And there'd be two, two benefits of that. One would be the epistemic one, which is clear. And the other one might be uh, avoiding the danger of um, sort of sprinkling, which is that you, know, you end up with people who are end up, can end up at the end of the day donating on the basis of their preferences. And what you may end up having is just a sprinkling of donations, which might be not enough for anybody to do anything with. Uh, whereas if they were concentrated and targeted, uh, they might produce more. Uh, more good. So I think that second question is actually clearer than the first one I think about it. So if you want to just answer the second one, I would be, I would appreciate you. Okay. In, Amer in American terms, Centre is United Way. Okay. Oh, there you go. All right. So um, in terms of um, empirically, the sprinkling problem doesn't seem to really happen. A lot of this stuff is really concentrated on a few big organizations. I totally agree with you that there are epistemic problems here. And that's, you know, when you think about it, for at least in the United States, you know, there's very few candidates for elected office. So, and, and there's tons of sort of intermediate institutions and other entities giving you information to help you make that decision. Um, so with NGOs, it's a million times harder for on all sorts of dimensions, and we have nobody helping us. We have Charity Navigator and places like that that are the opposite of, well, they're trying. Um, but um, so, I, so I totally agree that the epistemic burden is large and that we need some help. I'm a little hesitant about what you describe, in part because it frees, and NGOs can have an educative effect on the general public. Um, and that, that they would have no incentive to do that. Um, and any sort of concentration of power like that, it, you know, but I'm with you that that's a problem that needs to be, that everyone here is gonna maybe hopefully solve. Um, okay, so let me try your first question. Um, the point about drama wasn't so much about short term versus long term, it was more about um, that could be a problem with, um, you know, flooding in Pakistan that nobody cares about versus, you know, the, the, tsunami, the 2004 tsunami. Um, so my point there was only that um, big visuals aren't necessarily morally important. Um, but, um, uh, and in terms of the, um, and, and the other thing too is if you look more closely, even single emergencies aren't, like, it's not like things are normal, and then there's an emergency and they go back to normal, like the terrain is kind of much more sort of varied anyway. Um, uh, but I do take your point that, uh, well, I don't know, but I do agree that for, for a purely development organization, um, uh, 
well, even pearly development organizations, things happen, right? Unexpected things happen, right? Um, uh, but I think this kind of setup of, you know, sort of general commitments at the beginning and then, it, you know, detailed explanations after the fact, I think that kind of thing might be more important when decision making has to be, has to be rapid. So, so th there I would agree, but thanks. And you can go now, yeah. Oh, um, my question for you is, what do you think is the biggest long-term investment for uh, local citizens and for the uh, native uh, people in these places that are seeking the state that might not have access to it through these IMGOs otherwise? The biggest long-term long -term investment that they should be making? Or that the people of, in these towns and in these countries are okay. receiving this aid uh -huh. that they are getting from INGOs coming in and helping. Oh, because INGOs are, are just doing kind of Band-Aid sort of stuff? Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to know what you think would be a positive from this. What, what they should be getting instead of kind of short-term humanitarian aid? Yeah. Um, it varies tremendously from, from place to place. Place. Like if you think about, you know, different towns in Canada, you know, what do they, what sort of long-term investments do I they need? I guess asking what they need for developing countries, countries more specifically in Southeast Asia. Oh, it's up, I can't answer that question with any, I, I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be helpful. Yeah, sorry. So as soon as we start thinking of INGOs as somewhat governmental, highly political, and often second best, um, I'm sort of wondering how we strike the balance between letting the INGOs go into host countries, do their work without uh, concern of uh, political retribution, for example. But on the flip side, we also don't want to create a situation where INGOs go in and act uh, with impunity. So how do we balance that? So you don't want, um, in, your, in your language, you're worried on the one hand, you don't want sort of you know, powerful elites to kind of control INGOs too much, but you want the INGOs themselves to just have free reign to do whatever they want. Is that the, that's the problem? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, so um, this is a huge problem. And this is why, so just very briefly, in like 2003, there was a bunch of wide-eyed, starry-eyed INGO people said, we're going to develop an ombudsperson. And, we are, and, this, and this ombudsperson is going to be a way for aid recipients and people in aid recipient communities to actually sanction NGOs that do wrong. We're going to, like, they're going to be able to sue NGOs, all this stuff, right? Um, and so that was, you know, that's in, in some respects the idea, right? People, there shouldn't be sort of unaccountable power. We should, but one of the problems they ran into was the way in which these systems were being abused by elites in um, uh, poor countries, right? Um, or just, or not necessarily elites, like different factions sort of against each other, right? Um, so what we have now is, I think there's now 70 different accountability things, um, codes of conduct, standards, agreements that NGOs, various ones sign on to, and it's a mess. And there have been efforts to try to sort of consolidate these, and it hasn't worked. Um, and the reason is because this is really this is really hard. So I'm sort of describing to you kind of where the, the field is at right now. So um, uh, what there are are a lot of um, feedback mechanisms, complaints mechanisms, uh, efforts at after the fact um, uh, reports, efforts to you know there's like um, you know I don't know survey fatigue. You know, so like aid recipients have tons of survey fatigue. Like my God, stop asking me questions already. Um, so there's all these efforts circulating around that are not very well coordinated, that are much better than how things used to be, but that are short of kind of like this really sort of hardcore significant sanctioning for, for precisely the reason that you, that you point out. Um, <laughs> you gave a lot of um, 
So this editor presentation, a lot of examples of things not to focus on when deciding who's doing it, so it should matter how many countries they operate in. Um, I shouldn't focus on narratives because they pull my heartstrings, but I should focus on stats because there are things that are immeasurable. But what should you focus on? Right, is yeah. there anything I can focus on, or is there any NGOs who pull things together comparatively less bad? Right, so okay, so you're forcing my hand here a little bit. So um, I would say, think about, I don't know if this example works in Canada. Um, anyway, I'll try, I'll try this out. Okay, but um, so for the United States context, a good, like, sometimes we think, oh, um, I'm going to shop at this little tiny boutique, which is very authentic and good, and I'm going to avoid Walmart. Okay, so this idea that like big is bad and like small is good. Um, I'm giving you another negative. Anyway, the, the big, I think the big NGOs, I think there's a lot of economies of scale involved in this, in part because the, the big NGOs can afford to do research um, and sort of spend a lot of time having conversations. So um, I think in this, in this context, big is, is good. Um, uh, uh, they have the resources to do um, good um, evaluations of their own activities, things like that. Um, uh, so I, I wouldn't like, Small is beautiful, as I would sort of hedge away from that. I like organizations. This is another, I mean, it's a technical difference between me and the effective altruist. I like organizations that do a lot of different things because then there's not a bias towards, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you do a lot of different things, you don't have that problem quite as much. So um, I personally, this is not like, don't take this to mean these are the best organizations. I personally donate to Oxfam and Doctors Without Borders. I think there's arguments for other organizations. That's kind of what I do. Um, but it's, it's it, you know, it's hard. Um, and, you know, I think the more more people can pressure these organizations to give, pressure them for, the, for, for more relevant information, the easier it will be for you to make these kinds of, make these kinds of decisions. And can I also, just one more thing, historically, these organizations have changed a lot over the last 50 years. Um, so all these people sort of predicting the, their demise, I think that's a little bit premature. They've really shown a capacity to change a lot, which I think is good news for people pressuring them, right? I think there's room for them to, to change and respond, not, you know, sort of, in a, you know, endlessly so, but to a significant degree. Um, uh, I'm coming from the NGO world, uh, worked with NSF, worked with CARE, oh, worked with different organizations. Um, so very, thank you very much for, for your interesting talk, and there's definitely a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, of more time we should put on, on the ethics and, and the reflection on what we're doing. Uh, one of the things that's, uh, that I've seen and emphasized, and uh, maybe you can comment on that, but uh, and I guess those are obvious things, but one is the humanitarian versus development. Because uh, when you put this, this this chart of the number of countries within the nine countries, there are some that are in, in the humanitarian context or emergency context, which are way different than the developmental context that you refer to in your, in your some of your answers. But uh, that that touch a lot on, on the type of, uh, of uh, political action that you're taking, and also the, the relation that you have to governments, uh, donor to governments, which uh, have branches that are for uh, uh, humanitarian, which uh, which bring the Humanitarian ownership talks about independence, where development goes to a very different spectrum of action that is maybe much more political. So that's that's one thing that I think is important to emphasize. Uh, the other one is also the, the differences between NGOs, uh, an NGO like CARE that have 80% of the money that comes from government is quite different than NSF that have less than 20% that comes from government, which gives them a lot of independence in their actions and a very difficult di difference political action and advocacy and, and wording in the, in the action that they are uh, taking. So uh, those are, I think, are, are a few things that I'm sure that is more discussed in the book, but that for me is important to, uh, to emphasize. Uh, and maybe just a comment about the, the standards. There's, there's the, this list of standards, the core humanitarian standards that have been presented and now are, are, are getting more and more diffused. The, the JSI? The, the, the core humanitarian standards. The From the, the, jo the Joint Standards Initiative? The standards, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought Sphere dropped out. Anyway, but go on. Sorry. I thought well, Sphere dropped out of that. Yeah. And it's very, uh, maybe just the last thing in, in the, in, I'll be interested when, the, when, when you can read the book about the, the, the second death 
the issue of, of, of uh, I don't both grasp the, the, the concept totally, but uh, when, uh, one way that I look at it is it's very complementary. Uh, so from those, uh, those uh, NGO versus UN versus uh, uh, Red Cross, uh, it's all complementary action that is, that is done as well. So it's not going to be second best, but to be complementary one way or the other. I, I think I, I'll just say that I agree with everything you've said. I'm, um, I totally get, right, that even within MSF, the difference between, you know, MSF Amsterdam and MSF Spain, like the closer in you are, the, there, there are these huge differences, sort of even within the different section of MSF, not to mention sort of MSF versus care versus World Vision. So nonetheless, um, I'm still trying to, and you know, the amount of money that, you know, MSF is constrained, you know, less, or maybe differently, but less than care, right? Um, but I'm still trying to hold on to the possibility for people who are a little bit further away from this of trying to say something that's relevant across these organizations while fully acknowledging. You know, I was talking to what I have in the book a discussion from one Italian aid worker was like, NGOs have different souls. And I totally get that, right? Um, but I'm still trying to you know, find a way to say something um, for people who are a little bit further removed um, that might be you know, relevant a little bit more, more broadly. But yes, absolutely, sort of in development contexts, um, the relationship with the state is very different. Um, uh, and, I, uh, and I do take your point that sometimes complementarity is, works well, um, but I think it can be too easy for, I mean, MSF is always getting sucked into situations and staying for longer than it intends, and then all of a sudden it's, you know, re replacing, you know, governments, and, and so, and I fully, you know, Hugo Slim calls this ethics creep, right, because you're there, and then you see all these problems, and of course you want to stay, and. Descriptive, 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 yeah, okay. yeah. So but the problem, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, only in so far, like, as far as, like, the really interesting idea that like, eventual governance pulls us into deep, like, makes them more accountable to, like, overall consequences or long-term consequences, and that there's a kind of role. So, but you're just saying that that is descriptive, and I guess Yeah, but the, the problem is, is once you get yourself in, so I think there's good reasons for INGOs to avoid getting themselves into this situation in the first place, but the thing is, once you're into it, once that's what's happening, and there just seems to be this inexorable pull, once you're doing that, you're in a certain kind of relationship with people that makes leaving harmful in a way that I don't think is fully, often fully comprehended until you, until you understand that that's kind of the role that you're playing. Um, so no, I mean, part of why I talk about NGOs as second best is like normatively, no, I do not think that this is, you know, for all these structural reasons, they're not, you know, accountable in the sense of sanctionable by the people who they are trying to help. But once you're there and in that situation, you know, these, I think these ethics are kind of dynamic in, in, in a certain way. And once you're in a certain situation, you know, this, the problem facing you is different than it was before you were there. Can you tell me how much more time I have left so I know how quickly uh, to talk? We're, we're, we're at six. I oh. think I'd like to get Sorry. at least two more questions in. Go, go ahead, Rio. Yeah, I can go ahead. Okay, great. So thank you very much for your talk. I'm really looking forward to reading your, your, your latest book. I did order it, but I'm having trouble with that. So being used to pressing the delivery system is not that quick. So I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I didn't have time to read the book before your presentation today. We're really looking forward to reading it. Um, and so I have other questions, and I'll have the opportunity, as I said, to ask you more questions tomorrow. But just this one, because it just popped up in my mind. I was wondering, is in, in your book, do you, you know, in, within the list of the ethical curriculum, do you talk about the, you know, NGOs, the need for NGOs, perhaps the need for NGOs to design better exit plans 
within, okay, so let's think about the Haitian example. So hundreds of NGOs came in, and hundreds of NGOs left. And in a very poetic way. So I was just wondering, is sometimes NGOs don't stay long enough, and sometimes they stay too long. And then you also encounter the paternalist you know, side of issue of, the, uh, of all this problem. And I was wondering also, so when you are designing exit plans for NGOs, do you tap into you know, concepts or principles of transitional justice? Would this apply? Would this be pertinent to, to tie these literatures together? I was also thinking about, um, this was a comment from Richard Bellamy. I'm not sure if it's Richard. I know that there are two Bellamy's, and one is very much involved with the art key debate. Is that Richard, Richard Bellamy or Ben Bellamy? I think, uh, I don't want to guess. I think it's Richard, but anyway, go ahead. I think it's Richard. Yeah. So suppose it's Richard. So it's Richard Bellamy was talking about. So I know that as people hate R2P, so I'm not willing to imply that R2P is a good conceptual framework, but he was talking about the idea of leaving a life footprint. The, the principle of leaving a life footprint behind you. Do you think that kind of concept could also be helpful in the way uh, uh, very important and big NGOs might need to design their exit plan in context of emergency, in context of reconstruction, leading to their um, Yeah, I, I like that idea. I mean, I'm just responding. I hadn't heard of that, so I'm learning from you. Um, uh, it's very, I mean, it, the way it sort of hooks into my conception is it, it seems like a, a, a version or related to my idea of the second best, which is like an ethics of the second best is all about how do you promote transition to a situation where you are gone and whatever first best state of affairs is, is in place. Um, uh, so it's less emphasis on a light footprint all the way through and more on the kind of exit strategy kind of question. Um, uh, but certainly, I mean, once, if there's a trade-off between, you know, sort of important consequences or outcomes like saving lives, it might be hard to say, oh, we're not going to do this stuff because we have to have a light footprint. Um, but insofar as there wasn't that sort of trade-off or it wasn't significant, that strikes me as a really maybe helpful image. I don't know if this person might have, have, a, have a response to of, in terms of how to, how to think about that. Um, and the transitional justice stuff, um, I didn't engage with that literature in my book, um, so I don't know. But it, it seems it seems possible that there could be interesting connections there. sort of complaint mechanisms where the complaints then get publicized. Um, uh, but, but sort of full on, like real, the problem with the term accountability is it means so many different things. It can mean I just give an account of what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes it means there's a sanctioning component. Sometimes there isn't a sanctioning component. But the sanctioning component is kind of where the action is, where the bite is. And that's what's been sort of you know, really resisted either by the NGOs or sort of has been sort of really hard to put in place. And that's a big part of what makes this whole setup 
you know, there's nothing like deeply intrinsically magical about states. Like the issue is what, you know, states sometimes are able to do and one of the things is like real accountability. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's the problem. And so there are the, all of these efforts to kind of um, put, put, put more and more um, demanding and sort of rigorous positions that, things in place to get NGOs information about how aid recipients are responding, to get information out there so that third parties can sort of, you know, uh, uh, amplify what aid recipients are saying. But it's all, none of it is quite, I think, what we would sort of ideally want, giving the vital importance of basic services to people. Side, but I'll invite people who want to to join a group that will walk down to the faculty club for a uh, drink for a little while afterwards. Um, this concludes, I believe, both RGCS's and MBERC's public programming for the year. Um, so thank you to all of you who have taken part in those sessions over the course of the year, and please join me in thanking.